Well, good morning, family. Nearly 70 years ago, the incomparable Billie Holiday recorded a hauntingly beautiful song entitled, You've Changed. You've changed, she sang. That sparkle in your eyes is gone. Your smile is just a careless yawn. You're breaking my heart. You've changed. And people do change, don't they? Have you heard the notion that your cells in your body replicate themselves so that you're a new person inside and out every seven years? I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but it is fun to think about, isn't it? Now, the Bible tells us that God does not change. It even tells us that Jesus doesn't change. But what if I told you that there is a story in the Gospels that tells us that Jesus did change? Well, sort of. We like to use the word transfigured. The story is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Let's see what happened. Hear the word of the Lord. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. So we say, thanks be to God. It seems to me that the key to understanding the transfiguration of Jesus is the light mentioned in the story we just read. Have you ever experienced transfiguration? Have you ever seen it happen? I'm sure you're familiar with the way in which many women sort of have a glow when they are pregnant, right? Despite the physical discomfort, morning sickness, and all the rest, there is something about the state of pregnancy that transfigures many women while they are expecting. A different kind of transfiguration can come at the end of a rainstorm, where it was once dark, the clouds break, and depending on the time of day and the angle of the sun, you may see a rainbow, or you may see a shaft of light which cuts through and transfigures the landscape. After a snowfall, the world seems transfigured as the whiteness of the snow reflects and sparkles with every bit of light. Again, in the middle of great stress or tragedy, we see people's faces transfigured. I've seen it in my son's face when he sat to take an AP test one day at school. I've seen it in my daughter's face when she played volleyball. What we see in transfiguration is some aspect of reality which we don't normally see. We get a glimpse of some quality of a person which is normally either hidden or under control or not called for most of the time. Transfiguration does not normally add something which isn't there. Instead, it brings to light or brings light to something or someone. In the gospel description of the transfiguration, we have precisely that, a bringing to light. And we need to remember that when we read about this strange event in the life of Jesus. He was headed to Jerusalem, and he knew that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were lying in wait. They were plotting his death. In some sense, the transfiguration event marks a turning point in Jesus' life and ministry. And the events that follow this transfiguration lead Jesus directly to the cross in Jerusalem. Well, let's look at the event as Mark describes it. Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on a mountain to pray. 
they left the other nine disciples to wait. And while Jesus was praying, his whole being was bathed in light, covered in light, so that he himself shone brightly. And as they watched Jesus, Peter, James, and John saw Moses and Elijah appear with him. That's when Peter got a great idea. Hey, Jesus, we should build three shrines here, one for you, one to honor Moses, and, and one to honor Elijah as well. At this point, they were all overshadowed by a cloud, and they heard a voice that declared Jesus to be the Son of God. Then the cloud dissipated, and there were only four of them, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Part of what we read in the Gospel account is that the disciples were not particularly sure who Jesus was. Peter's suggestion of building three shrines for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah seems to put Jesus on equal footing, equal standing with Moses and Elijah. Now, don't get me wrong, that's pretty exclusive company, isn't it? Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And these are the two bases of Jewish faith and life, the law and the prophets. Obviously, they understood that Jesus was at least just as important as the law and the prophets, but probably no more. But that thinking didn't last very long. The disciples are immediately told by the voice, which we assume to be the voice of God that we heard at Jesus' baptism, that Jesus is much, much more, that indeed he is the Son of God, the Beloved, who was to be listened to and believed. Now, let's step back a bit and think about the light. Way back in the book of Exodus, after God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, Moses went up on Mount Sinai where he talked with God. And when he came back down the mountain, his face shone with so much light that the Jews were terrified. He had to wear a veil to cover his face until the light wore off. And any Jew who heard about the transfiguration of Jesus by light would connect it with this part of the Exodus story. So today we have a transfiguration which made Jesus so blindingly white or bright that nothing earthly could have produced such light. His deity is immediately confirmed by the presence of Moses and Elijah. And then the voice from the cloud identified him as the one who was promised by and who was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And then suddenly it was all over. And everything was back to normal. Or was it? Jesus started his trek toward Jerusalem. He began walking toward his death, walking toward that moment when he would take the worst that sin could dish out, and in doing so, demonstrate the amazing love of God for us. Suddenly, having just been declared to be my son, the beloved, Jesus and we are back in the everyday world. And having been transfigured in the presence of Peter, James, and John, he and they and we have the regular everyday tasks to do. He and they and we are back to the way of the cross. Transfiguration. While it may change our understanding, while it may confirm our faith, while it may even confuse us, does not and never will take us out of the real world. Obviously, the disciples were confused by this event. We would have been confused too, wouldn't we? We have, in some sense, seen him transfigured, haven't we? we we've met Jesus. We've been fed by him or healed by him. And so we have some experience of that light that is in and through him. Just as we have seen a woman transfigured by her pregnancy or the end of a storm transfigured by the return of light, so we have seen his majesty at some time and place in our lives. And having seen him, we shall never be the same. We have, if you will, seen the light. If only for a moment, and we are different for all time. We still have to walk the way of the cross, but having been given the grace of his light, we will walk in its presence, his presence, and our lives too will be transfigured if we let his light shine through us. 
And like the transfiguration of Jesus, this will happen in the middle of the real world, in the middle of our lives. And truth be told, it won't be seen all the time. The transfiguration of Jesus was a singular event at one point in his life and ministry. But we are called to let his light shine through us as often as possible, as much as possible. And that means that we should constantly seek to be in his light, to live in his presence, so that his light can shine through us into the real world. Just to be clear, we are not the light. The light has come to us, and each of us have to some degree, and each in our own special way, been given the light. It is in our everyday lives that the light must shine through so that others may receive the light as we did. Here, in this world, in our lives, not just on mountaintops, but in the valleys of life. Now, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of the season of Lent. And as we go into Lent, as we seek to look at ourselves and our service to neighbors and to God, let's center on letting the light shine through rather than on the darkness that is in all of us. Of course, we must be honest about our sins, our failures, and our doubts, and our need for his grace. But the real story of Lent and the real value of Lent will come as the light returns on Easter morning. We need to be honest about our darkness, sure, but far more importantly, we need to let his light shine through so that others, seeing the light, may learn to follow it and find Jesus and his love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Awesome one, creator of all, the light of your glory fills the heavens. The breath of your spirit blows through the skies. Stars above stand silent witness to the power of our God. By your word, all things were made. By your breath, all are sustained. By your hand, we were molded as a potter caresses the clay, formed from earthly dust into an image of the divine. By your grace, we live, your creation serving and worshiping its creator. Receive, we pray, our sacrifice of praise. Forgive us for getting frustrated. Forgive us for losing hope. Help us to use words of peace. Help us to be safe places for those who are scared, apprehensive, and unsure. Help us to use words that heal. And now using the words debts and debtors, let us pray with boldness the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As always, thank you. I really do appreciate you joining me today, and I hope that these words were helpful to you. If they were, will you like, review, and share this episode? If you leave a good review, it will help other people to find and benefit from these devotional thoughts. By the way, if you have a need or a prayer request, please leave a message in the comments section, and then be assured that I will be praying for you and for your need. Now, this week, your job is to love at least three people and make sure at least one of them doesn't deserve it. Why? Because everyone needs love. And everyone needs to know that God loves them, no matter what. Remember, with Jesus, we always, always, always have hope. Now receive these words of benediction today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.